come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie review podcast comes your way every week. We hope you'll uh, do us a favor. Go on over to wherever you found us and give us a like, a star rating, or a review, because all of that stuff helps us get found by other folks like you. And you can help us become the fastest growing movie review podcast on the internet. And as far as we know, because we're saying that's true, it could actually <laughs> be true. Uh, who knows what's happening now with all this going on. <laughs> right. If you're discovering new podcasts, we, thank you for listening to us. We could be the only podcast left. That's right. You know, yeah. well, we know. <laughs> <laughs> and in the future, when they dig everything up, I mean, just in case, we may as well you know, approach yep. it that way. Uh, these are the Internet Radio Superstars. Sean. Holly. <laughs> Michaela. And I'm Colin. And tonight, uh, we, well, but did I say we choose the movies round robin. Uh, that's how we figure out what we're going to watch each week. And tonight, whose turn was it to pick a movie? Colin. Yes, Colin, Sean. Uh, what did you pick tonight? Uh, to celebrate, uh, I chose, I went uh, back in the archive. Celebrating? Well, yeah, I get to celebrate that I get to pick a movie. And subject you all to it. Tonight we watched <laughs> a it. movie. That's it. That's your bar of celebration. <laughs> it only comes around once a month. You got to give this to okay. me. Um, you know, I feel I feel like right now our entire world is celebrating every fucking thing we can. Yeah. <laughs> this is the highlight of our like week. The time between picks is very long sometimes. Yeah. 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 Especially now when time has no meaning. Uh, so no. Uh, tonight we watched the movie that was called... The Curse of the Werewolf. And that comes at us from the year 1961. Directed by? Uh, Terrence Fisher. But more importantly, produced by? Uh, Hammer Films. There we go. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, it, like, uh, I know we've been doing a lot of Canon films. It, it seems like we end up, like, in these, there's, like, these uh, companies that have produced films that uh, become kind of iconic beyond you know the movies that they did. Uh, yeah. Hammer Films is like one of those for horror uh, because in the fifties and sixties and seventies they produced a whole bunch of uh, of horror films that included. Uh, I think they did eight. Well, they did. Uh, it, they started off. Uh, is this too much information? You want to know this stuff about Hammer Films? Yeah. <laughs> They uh, they started off and uh, it was an older no, company. No, shut though. up, Colin. <laughs> Jesus, this is the deep dive. This is where Colin goes nothing. crazy talking about Hammer. I love Hammer film. Uh, these these guys. No, I love I love I love Hammer too. I was gonna wait to mention it, but as far as like these monsters go, like Dracula, uh, the Wolfman, or werewolves and, and Frankenstein's and shit like that, I like the Hammer movies more than I like the Universal versions. Really? Yes, I do. Why? For for all of them. For uh, uh, probably I'm gonna say all of like them. Lots of, oh yeah, I love I love Hammer more than the Universal Monsters. That's okay, a, so me. when that I said why, yeah, I'm not disagreeing That's, with you, but I just got we got to find out. We got to mine this one. Okay, so yeah, what what's what's going on there? Uh, um, well, I I think it's um, uh, I mean I've seen more Hammer movies than Universal movies. I'll give you that. But the Hammer monsters, first of all, um. The the uh, the effects it's usually a lot gorier or more gory than the old stuff. Oh yeah. Um, and I just kind of like the territory they cover. I love um, Cushing's uh, Frankenstein. I think he's great in that role. And he plays he the like, doctor, <laughs> not the monster. But just yeah. in case you're one of not those the people, who's, uh, the Frankenstein. Yeah, Frankenstein is the doctor, not the monster. Yes, not the monster. Uh, I love him doing that role over like six movies, something like that. Uh, he did that. Uh, I think it was well. There were there were seven movies in the in the series. I think he sits out horror of Frankenstein. He's not in that. one. Yeah, there's one he's not in. That's the one with um, David love- Prowse, who played Darth Vader as the monster. Yes. Yeah. Have you seen that guy's uh, Darth Vader documentary? No. It's no. so bad. Don't watch it. It's all about him, like oh. being bitter that he didn't get the credit for being Darth Vader. Oh, <laughs> and it all went to Jer- James Earl Jones. Yes, and he's very upset about it. Yeah, David Prowse, I think and, is his name. Yes, Sorry, and then dude. he had, like went on a whole tirade about how like if he had known that the line line was going to be "No, I am your father," he would have acted it differently. It's like 
you just held up your hand, dude. Like, there's not a lot of acting to be done. We can't even see your face. <laughs> yeah, you right? can't move around and do much with that costume. Yeah, um, he, the documentary is like I'm your father or something like that. It, it has a very <laughs> weird title, but if you want to like hate watch something that you're just like really, dude, Ooh, go check it out. I might want to hate watch that. That sounds like a good hate watch. I like that everybody has documentaries about them now. Even uh, I mean, everybody. Kane Hodder's got one. You know, it's like they yep, got Tom Savini. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. But yeah, uh, Hammer. So I mean, basically that was the thing. There, there were stock company, 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 company. Yeah. Okay. There was stock company out of uh, problem of England. Word? Well, stock company like a theater company and a movie yeah, company. Yeah. Uh-huh. So a stock company company that <laughs> that worked out of uh, England. They were founded in 1934, but uh, they were taken over by two guys, uh, James Carreras and Anthony Hines, in 1946. Right. So this is basically when the era of what we know as Hammer started. And uh, they hit pay dirt. Well, first of all, they did the uh, the Quatermass experiment. I think it was a, a big box office hit. Uh, one of the stars of that is actually in tonight's movie, Curse of the Werewolf. He played the beggar. He uh, Hammer made him famous as the he was the guy who came back from space and had the you know the space goo on him in Quatermass experiment. Space goo. But uh, somewhere in I think it was 1957, they got the idea that they could um, remake because all the Universal horror movies had been sold to television. And they were uh, running in shock theater and on reruns. And so kids were able to see them in the 50s, you know, like on late night TV. And so Hammer got the idea that, hey, we can actually go. These are public domain characters. We can go and make uh, new versions in color. They started off with The Curse of Frankenstein. It became a huge hit. And I think, like Sean said, the uh, appeal of it was because it's in color, now it can be more graphic. You can actually have like, uh, you know, some bloody violence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the labs, I mean, come on, the labs look much cooler with all the lights and everything going on in there. And Peter Cushing's just an actual, I mean, he's a total, I mean, like, you know him as Grandma of Tarkin, but he is a total dick as as Dr. Frankenstein <laughs> in these movies. That's what I love about him. He, he, like, does not give a shit. He's like, my creation is the thing. I don't care who I have to go through. This is it. This is what I live for. And it, I think I prefer right. the atmosphere and the score to a Universal monster movie than Hammer. Well, the Universals they have that great, you know, uh, you know, they're with the big painted backdrops and you know, like fog oh, like, everywhere. Yeah. Oh yeah yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know. That's why you know I don't know who I would. I think. Oh, I like the dark, the the, the dirty castles of the. They're always the hammer. a dirty castle, a dirty basement. <laughs> Every single one. In, in the hammer ones, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Always. You never get like, to go outside in a hammer movie. It's a, well, it's a dirty village <laughs> mentality in there and that always, uh, I think, is cool. <laughs> <laughs> they have problems with the aristocracy like, in uh, in England. Yeah. This is a movie about a werewolf that doesn't have any sort of like nature or countryside or any sort of forest or anything like that, really. It all really mm-hmm. takes place within like the con- confines of a fortress or a city, and mm-hmm. some dirt mounds. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, well, ironically, this movie was based on the uh, on a on a novel that was called Werewolf of, of Paris. This was written in 1933 by a guy named Guy Endor, and uh, apparently, it's like a kind of weaves in a bunch of historical stuff about the uh, Franco-Prussian War or whatever. Um, oh, fascinating! Yeah. Uh, I mean, apparently it's called, it's considered like the werewolf novel, right? Okay, so uh, I haven't read it, um, but uh, the guy, Endor, who wrote it, um, he actually worked in the movies. Uh, He wrote um, Mark of the Vampire that starred uh, Bela Lugosi, but that was uh, for MGM and not Universal at that time. That was 1935. He also wrote the Peter Lorre movie, Mad Love. and then he was on the communist blacklist for a while. But um, the the reason that this movie, so the, the Curse of the Werewolf takes place in Spain, even though the, it's based on a book that's set in Paris, because Hammer had built sets for a movie that was supposed to be called uh, The Rape of Sabine, which is a story oh. about the uh, rape of the Sabine women in, in Rome in like the 8th century B.C. But... Um, 
They, they decided not to film this, right? Well, it was they. So for some, so this is how I don't get it. The, that's the title, but the actual movie they were trying to make was about the Spanish Inquisition. But that was the title of it. The no rapist expected Sabine. that. And the apparently the British Board of Censors got a hold of the script and said this was just you know, well they went after Hammer like every time they tried to do anything they were like tone this down tone this down take this out I mean we were in, living in very conservative times in Britain in 1961 when this was made and so they couldn't make that movie so they instead of destroying the sets they're like well well let's just rewrite. A Curse of the Werewolf to take place in Spain. <laughs> so, bam, there you go. So, Spanish village. So the, the book is in Paris. They made it look like it in Spain and they filled it with British actors. Yeah. Hello. That makes sense. What's all this then? I love it. <laughs> What's all this? The Spanish hello, countryside. Hello. You know, I actually. Like when he, but I like, like when, he, yeah, when he has the senor at the end. <laughs> like, hello, hello, senor. senor. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. You know, but Governor, uh, Senor. actually, as Michaela was saying that there wasn't a whole lot of uh, uh, like forests and stuff like that. That's where, you know, Hammer or no, it's a Universal excels. You know, they have the fog, foggy woods and all that stuff. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. Going back, um, the Wolfman, 1941, the Lon Chaney one doesn't actually have like uh, a, a full moon shot the entire movie. Hmm. As far as I know. This I will have to confirm again, but as I was doing my research, I'm like, and then I'm like, did I just imagine that ahead? Because I think there is in like Frankenstein versus the Wolfman, the second one. You know, you see the the full moon out the window and it turns them into yeah. Because mm-hmm. um, there's so many fog forests, though. Who cares? You know. <laughs> but Spain is known for its mountains. No, I don't know. It's some hilly. But I, you would know it by this movie. <laughs> no. Um, it's a dirt pile. Did you know, uh, I mean, the other thing, uh, I don't know, Hammer, when they were, uh, you know, when I was saying stock company, there, there's a bunch of characters or actors that they would reuse over and over again. Obviously, Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee made, uh, I think, eight Dracula movies for them. But all of these, like, little incidental characters that you see or people that you see in the background, uh, you begin to recognize as you watch these movies because, like, they keep showing up. And uh, one of the Hammer um, hallmarks is a guy named Michael Ripper, and he was uh, he played a character here called Old Soak, who was the town drunk in the green uh, vest or whatever. And he uh, was in a total of, I think, 35 Hammer movies in his career. I mean, obviously, he did stuff beyond that, too, but 35 of them. Right. So Damn. when you, when you think when you watch a Hammer movie, you will most likely be seeing Michael Ripper in there. We've done I think three Hammer movies on this podcast. We did Captain Kronos, Vampire Hunter. We did uh, Quatermass in the Pit, and this one is that it, Sean? Are we, am I right on that? Uh, I think so. I don't think we've done any. I feel like we're or anything missing. like that. Yeah, because we haven't done it. Wasn't oh, no, there we, a Dracula movie we did? You are correct. We did Dracula AD 1972. And guess what? Uh, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> Michael Ripper is not in any of those. So we have not put oh, him God on the wall of fame. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I thought we were going to put him on a wall. Unfortunately not. That's what I was trying to yeah, we were building to it. but Not no. his night. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Curse of the Werewolf uh, stars Oliver Reed. How familiar are you guys with Oliver Reed? Not at all. Yeah. This movie. <laughs> no, not really. I know the name, but I, I don't I don't know if I'm familiar with his stuff. I'm sure I've seen him in things, but nothing comes to mind. Well, he was at one point um, England's biggest box or biggest star. He was uh, at one point considered for the role of James Bond. I think at that for what would that be Honor Majesty's Secret Service when Sean Connery quit. He was in the running with a couple other people, you know. Um, I can see that. This was not his first role, but it was like for his first, I think, leading role. And also at the end of his uh, life, he said that, you know, when I heard an interviewer ask him, you know, like, uh, what, what, what movie do you think you're going to be remembered for? And he's like, Curse of the Werewolf, which is kind of, you know, that's uh, it, it, it's cool that he thought so fondly of the movie after he became like this huge star. Uh, he was in... Um, Let's see. What would you guys know him from? Well, the horror audience is going to know him from either uh, David Cronenberg's The Brood or uh, Burnt Offerings, which he was in with Karen Black. But uh, you may have seen him in The Three Musketeers or the the movie musical Tommy, the the Who uh, movie. He was famously in a couple of Ken Russell movies. Ken Russell's the guy 
who made uh, a movie that we've talked about on this show, but haven't actually watched called Lair of the White Worm and Altered States. Uh, but oh, yeah, yeah. he made a movie called The Devils, which was uh, banned by the Catholic Church, and you still can't see it to this day. It briefly showed up on Shutter a couple years ago for like a month. Uh, I don't think you can rent it uh as the catholic church has banned the movie but it's got uh, Kurt, uh well, now i want to watch it i, I have yeah, a uh, well wait. no it's probably nothing <laughs> uh, probably it, it's kind I mean, of extreme have they seen william shatner get possessed by demons i mean come on <laughs> if you're gonna in, if you're gonna ban something in the devil's reign <laughs> yeah. um but he was uh he was in um uh what was the the well i said the devil's tommy that was ken russell and uh women in love where he had a famous scene apparently where he uh, naked wrestles with Alan Bates in front of a fireplace. And that became like a big hullabaloo in 1969. Uh, and later he was in uh, nice. the adventures of Baron Munchausen. He was in Stuart Gordon's the pit and the pendulum. And he was in gladiator in 2000 with Russell Crowe, uh, which was his last movie. Cause Alan's he, favorite movie. he died during the making of the film. Oh, so he, okay. He's the one who died. Oh! in the making. Okay, yeah. that I know. Until you mentioned Gladiator, yeah. I was like, I have seen none of those movies. Yeah, he he was Proximo. He was the Gladiator trainer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they yeah, yeah. Like CG add him in some parts and use a stand-in. Yeah, but even still, he won a uh, what was it? The BAFTA, I think, for best supporting actor for that role. Oh, nice. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, yeah. Oliver Reed and I his... forget the listeners haven't heard your uh, after recording rants about how much you hate Gladiator, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go back and watch that movie. <laughs> Dude, I have to I see it again. Bring it up. I still stand by it. I love that movie, and I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> it's Colin's go-to example of the Oscars are bullshit. Yeah, it is. It was the yeah the year the gla- well okay so I don't well maybe I rephrase it wrong. Let me take it back. I don't hate the movie. It just that was like uh, yeah. yeah. What was the- it up against that year? <clears throat> like it shouldn't have been that movie. We've had this exact discussion yeah. off mic so we, many times. Many times. So many yeah. Times. Um. Well, he was a uh, famously, I think, in, in addition to being an actor, right? Oliver Reed was one of these guys who was known as a like maybe one of the the all time legendary uh, blackout drunk booze men, right? There is incidental or uh, anecdotal evidence, which are uh, anecdote. Uh, you know, people t- say that there was a story that uh, he and thirty six drinking buddies. Uh, consumed 60 bit gallons of beer, 32 bottles of scotch, 17 bottles of gin, four crates of wine, and a bottle of baby cham in one evening. Wow. Baby cham made from real baby? I don't actually know what that is. And I'm probably saying I it wrong. It's I'm probably a giant drinking buddy. Yeah. I know. I was just going to say that. <laughs> Yeah. And that's like that's like the only story I've ever heard about Andre the Giant consistently is how much he would drink. <laughs> Well, yeah, just look how he, he holds a beer with his two fingers. I'm sure he drank a lot. <laughs> well, that's actually what killed Oliver Reed, apparently, uh, during the, the during the filming of Gladiator. I don't know if he had been sober for a while. I mean, this is a guy who, like, went on Johnny Carson and David Letterman, like, drunk, where David Letterman actually would ha- had to cut away from him at one point because he was getting mad being asked about his drinking while he was drunk on the, on the show. Um, but apparently during the filming of the movie, this is what I've heard, you know, just uh, from the internet, that he was sober, uh, but he went to an Irish bar, which is probably a bad, bad move if you're an alcoholic, and uh, somebody challenged him. I think they were, uh, I think they said it was sailors on shore leave challenged him to a drinking contest. And witnesses said he drank eight pints of German lager, a dozen shots of rum, half a bottle of whiskey, and a few shots of Hennessy, uh, and did arm wrestling and uh, killed over and died at the age of 61. (laughs) Jesus. What a way to go, man. I had no idea that was how he died. That is a way to go. I had no idea either. Yeah. I'm sorry, but Holy that's, shit. that's I, I mean, that's clear alcohol abuse and it's not a joking matter, but that's a fucking right. way to go. <laughs> I know that, that that catapults you into some kind of stratosphere <laughs> of something. Uh, and Chris, so like sailors with manslaughter, then like, well, it was a heart a attack. Alcoholic to a drinking contest. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you got, you're making your own decisions at that point. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, the last bit on Oliver Reed, I guess uh, the only thing I got, uh, Christopher Lee, 
uh, was interviewed in 2014, and he said about Oliver Reed, he said when he started uh, drinking, after drink number eight, he became a complete monster, and it was awful to see. So, I mean, it sounds I like I think he, you can say that about most people. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what? Like, eight drinks monster, is a eight. lot. Well, speaking of turning into a monster. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you, all right. Show me the piece of paper this segue was written down on. No, that would, uh, yeah. yeah. That I, was too I can, good. I come up with one every once in a while. It's like once a year or something <laughs> like that. Uh, okay. So, Curse of the Werewolf is a movie that starts off somewhere in uh, Spain 200 years ago. And um, it doesn't have a pretty good um, opinion of the, um, there's like an authority anti-authority bias going on through a lot of this movie. Uh, we yep. meet a, a traveling beggar who goes to visit. Is it a Marquis or Marquise? How do you say? A mar- they say Marques. Is it because they're yeah. British? Are we saying Marquis that's like the Marquis? Mar- Mar-Kes. Right? Marques? He's the Marques. Oh, okay. Yeah, Marques. Yes. yes. Well, this uh, beggar ends up arriving there um during the, the the town is basically shut down because there's a, a wedding going on the marquis is getting married right mm-hmm. and he stumbles in and uh and comes under oh he's greeted at the door by uh, desmond llewellyn who all recognizes q from the james bond mo- <laughs> movies right um and uh he well i mean he ends up they end up making uh, fun of this guy Right, who's just kind of yeah, there he, trying to get some food? Right, the dude's a dick. Like the the guy that the Marquesa has married is a uh, is an asshole, and so he's making fun of the beggar, um, and he makes him dance for his drink and food, and they make fun of him, and they get him super drunk, and, then, and they buy him. That's right, as a pet, because he is yes. no more than an animal. Another theme that's going to run throughout the movie and plays into uh, where we're going, but. Um, the uh yeah i mean i don't know it's like all these guys in the white wigs and all that are just like laughing at every single person's misfortune i think that's just an indictment of like uh just are we saying authority at that time or just you know i don't know rich people not not necessarily authority but rich people okay uh they end up uh throwing this guy in the dungeon of the castle uh where he's just this is back in the day when they would just throw you in the dungeon and forget you were right. there. <laughs> yeah, they don't check their dungeons. <laughs> we checked the dungeons lately. He does have a friend, though. Who's his friend? Uh, uh, the little that girl. little, the little servant girl. Yeah. Yes. Who's a mute? She comes to see him every day and gives him food. I think with her father, and then mm-hmm. uh, ultimately one day she gets moved. Uh, she well, she grows up to be an adult. And what happens to this guy? What's going on with him down in the dungeon all by himself? I mean, he's kind of turning into a <laughs> werewolf on his own. He gets very hairy. Like, I've never seen, like, arm hair grow like that before. Is this just to establish... I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to play up the idea of, like, the whole animalistic thing, right? That Yes. Oh, yeah, indeed. And uh, because he's become bestial, right? He doesn't even really talk anymore. I mean, he's been down there for, I don't know, how many years, 10 years, something like that. Um, she gets moved out of the dungeon, becomes a servant girl to the Marquis who, uh, what happened to his wife? She died like of, uh, what'd they say? Um, I missed that when she, I, it was, it was in voiceover. It's like he drove her because of the way his ways, he drove her to an early death and most of his friends all went away and died and all that stuff. So he was left alone in his castle. Oh shit. You know what that implies to, to, to scab over. She died because he was a dick? I think Basically, she yes. died because of his okay. dick. I think he had a case of syphilis, <laughs> right? Because that's what's implied there, because I didn't actually I catch that. Him. Well, he had bro, he had these sores all over his face and all that. He's trying to you know, uh, puncture the pimples or squeeze the pimples. Okay. Yeah, I totally missed like why he looked like that. And I, yeah, I totally no, missed All that. I heard was the voiceover guy say it drove her to an early death, but... If we okay. want to go that direction, works for me. Right? Censors at the time <laughs> he, wouldn't let he that put go. Her in the grave. We're reading between the lines here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, there weren't enough lines for me to read between. They left yeah. a lot out. Yeah. 
Well, probably because back then, you know, you did have the censor board like coming down on you and taking a bunch of stuff out. I'm surprised in some ways of what this movie gets away with because uh, because too, yeah. for 1961, because, uh, well, there was a, a something at the very end we got to talk about when we get there. But uh, she gets um, she displeases the marquee basically because he comes on to her, this scabby old dude. And so he throws her in the dungeon with the um, the beggar who's now mm-hmm. completely bestial. And uh, it's a really, that scene is, it's kind of like, it's scary and touching at the same time because, you know, it's like this is supposedly like they have a friendship. The movie is established, right? Yeah. Uh, but once she's but on he, the... But he's so far gone. Well, when he, he approaches her. her, you know, there's like this this look in his eye like he's he's looking at her like she's supposed to react in some way. And she just, is just like horrified because she realizes what position she's in. And then he mm-hmm. changes, you know, there's like he is gone. There's not much left to the, the man there anymore. It's the beast. And she he rapes her. We don't see this because it's mm-hmm. 1960s. But I am surprised that what they do show, which is her like the after effect of the of the rape where she has like some blood on her uh on her chest which is like probably you know scandalous for 1961 mm-hmm. probably um yeah this sets up when this movie was heavily censored when it came out <laughs> and the in, sex, in the UK or, well I'll say and this and it was so good for him that he just died did she <laughs> did she kill him do you think i don't know i mean he's dead yeah, because it's like in a corner and he's dead. So I'm assuming, and we assume that's the next morning. So maybe she was able to somehow fend him off in some way and 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 kill him. I don't know. Maybe people have a, a way of conveniently dying when they're not needed in the plot anymore in this movie. <laughs> yes, this is true. So uh, the woman escapes and kills the marquee, and then all right, she heads off into the countryside where I don't know if she's trying to commit suicide or something. She's found by um, Don Alfredo. I'm not sure of his last name, but the uh, our hero character, right? This is Clifford Evans, mm-hmm. who was also in Hammer's uh, Kiss of the Vampire. Um, is it Laredo? Maybe. I can't remember. We just watched it. I'm sorry, uh, fans of the movie, sure. if we're butchering this. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll hang up. Okay, so then this is... I didn't the, really catch anyone's name, so... Oh, I think it's Corito. Like, his name is Leon Corito. Okay, there you go. Well, this is this is his dad. This is uh, uh, Don Don Alfonso Corito. So what do we know about this guy? This is the guy who saves her life. Uh, he looks like... Um, um, what'd you say, Howie? He lo- oh, he looks like Robert Goulet. <laughs> yeah, Robert Goulet! <laughs> yes, he does. A cross between Robert Goulet and Burt Reynolds, maybe, or something like that. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, he ends up taking her in. He's not married to the woman of the house. Uh, I thought that, his servant. Yeah, I thought they were married. That was that wasn't his too. wife. No, no. it's a servant. Yeah, because later well, on he, he calls he calls him father and her aunt. Yeah, because oh, at some point I later he, he said, "My servant Teresa will, you know, I need to get her here for something." And during the climax, and they're right. like, "What? That wasn't his wife." Which no, I suppose would weird. explain why they don't have a kid of their own. I don't know what happened to his wife. Oh. Well, he takes little Leon in, uh, or sorry, he takes in the the woman, uh, the the mute yes. uh, servant girl, and she's pregnant. And so she uh, gives birth on Christmas Day to an unwanted uh, baby named Leon. This uh, is apparently the second thing, you know, of the uh, the curse. Right? This whole thing's just going bad. These uh, this kid's got no hope. <laughs> um, no. So much so that uh, when they take him to be baptized, uh, the the uh, the holy water bubbles. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. This is like sign after sign. These people should probably get rid of this kid. But they are determined to love him because I think this is the thing that the priest explains uh, after there are several. Oh, yeah. And the, the servant girl, she she dies uh, after childbirth. <laughs> yeah. Right after. She's very happy. Yeah. And then she has a little stomach bug and then she's dead. <laughs> As you do. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, that's it. 
So they they lay in right here the central uh, struggle of the movie, right between the good and the evil, the light and the dark, and whatever. The priest is basically saying that uh, this is is this a twist on werewolf mythology a little bit? Um, basically, the kid was born with the curse. Yes. Right. How does the it's priest explain this? Held in check or cured? Yeah, but tell me, how does uh, what's uh, what is the priest like? How? Uh, how did the kid become a werewolf? Uh, it says there's that, a spirit, like uh, he's inhabited. Sometimes a spirit finds a body that the soul is weak, and so they have an f- internal fight. And that's, he's describing the boy, he's like his soul is weak, so the spirit of, is able to get in there, and that's the fight he has between being human and turning into a werewolf every full moon. And how that's do you, the short version. How do you keep this at bay? Love, Colin. Because <laughs> love, I guess, is supposed to that encourages the human, the human heart, right? Love and kindness right. and all this, whereas uh, vice, lust, and uh, you know all the seven deadly sins basically bring you closer to the animalistic side. If you indulge mm-hmm. one, then you will become a werewolf during the full moon. This is interesting because most of these movies, you know, uh, hinge upon the idea of somebody is bitten by a uh, wolf and then becomes uh, a werewolf. Um, right. I don't know if I can think of another one off he- offhand where somebody's just born with it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. This and then at the end of the movie, you find out there's two of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's how, how it always goes. There's only two. Yeah. We're not saying in this one, but that's the way that uh, storytelling is going now. <laughs> yeah, this is the only one that doesn't follow those rules. No one's bitten by a werewolf, and there's not a surprise second one. <laughs> in some ways, well, we barely God. got a first one. Yeah, it does. Yeah, this uh, movie couldn't afford two. Sorry, what? Although one, well, I said this movie couldn't afford two werewolves. Yeah, this is oh, also no, fun. but someone someone was bitten by one. A couple people were bitten. But not to become right, a werewolf. But that's not how it was passed. Yeah, well, I know. But we did get the bite. Because <laughs> that's what well, we wonder. Like, if he would have bitten someone, could he have turned somebody into a werewolf? I wonder. I don't know. I mean, the the mythology here doesn't explicitly say one way or the other. There is no one no, who survives more an attack. Spiritual than than viral. Yeah, he's just born with something wild within. And we get to see little Leon. Apparently, you know, the, the middle section of the movie is basically the parents coming to this realization, the parents, the, the adopted family coming to the realization that the um, there's goats being slaughtered out in the pasture. Uh, they think there's a wolf doing it. And eventually, I think a hunter actually does take a um, shot at the wolf and, it, and you know little leon wakes up with a, a bullet in his arm how did he get this i <laughs> <Yeah>. wonder <laughs> good shot pepe yeah pepe with his bullets out there pepe becomes a su- subject of ridicule there's a whole drama that takes place within the village because pepe and his, his wife's trying to defend his honor because he apparently uh, missed the wolf uh that's killing the um all the livestock um so then Pepe makes the silver bullet because he knows that there's a werewolf out there, right? Because that's the talk that's going yeah, there's on also in town. A, right. There's a drunk in the bar who's just like, I there's, I know what's wrong, but I shall not speak of it. <laughs> that's Michael Ripper. That was Michael Ripper right there. That's oh, the right, hammer yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the drunk. Yeah. They're always just like, give me another drink and I'll tell you more. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> like, you son of a bitch. Just stick yeah, around. That's why you don't pay in advance. That's why you got to wait through and get the information first, then pay with the drink. Um, well, the little kid who plays uh, young Oliver Reed, I thought that kid looked just like little Oliver Reed. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he does. He's creepy. His like piercing blue eyes are really unsettling. Yeah, both of them or just the kid? The kid. He's also like Especially. a little, uh, like Ralphie. I thought he had that kind of face, like Ralphie from Christmas Story. A little bit, yeah. 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 And, he, and he talks in that innocent way, but the things he's saying, it's like I dreamt I was drinking blood. <laughs> <laughs> I dreamt I'm a wolf. I was drinking blood. It scared me, Father. Please help me. Yeah. Well, Dad comes up with an idea. We're going to put bars on the windows. I always wonder about this because, like, that basically traps. If he does turn into a werewolf, then he's going to be in the house with you. But at least I suppose yeah. you're keeping him from going out into the world where he's going to be shot by the world. You're protecting him from going out into the world. Um, I have a question about this scene. 
Okay. So when he's up on the, when the kid is up on the bars of the window and he's like shaking them, trying to get out and he has like the little fangs popping out Mm -hmm. and then they pull him away from the window and set him down in bed and he like goes back to normal. Yeah. What the fuck's that all about? I think that's the, Mm -hmm. uh, the parental familial love because they're stroking his forehead and all that. It's like, oh, oh, he he feels, you know, because it basically wakes him up from the nightmare of, uh, of being the, the animal is subverted by the human uh, side of him comes back through. It's, it's like in the Avengers when Hulk gets the lullaby. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what it's like. It's such a lame way to like s- subdue something like a werewolf, you know? I, w- I want a new werewolf movie made soon where somebody's like, wait, I saw a movie once and they just try and hug the werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> <That's terrific hat. laughs> Yeah, Wait, it sounds like that something would that would happen in what we do in the shadows. It uh, does. It really uh, does. Yes. Some movie once. Hold on. That's got to <laughs> they got to do that at some point. This movie, ironically, I forgot to to mention for all uh horror fans out there who haven't seen it, you have heard of it before because you saw American Werewolf in London. And in American Werewolf in London, David asks Alex, uh, did you ever see the wolf man? And she says, the one with Oliver Reed? And he's like, no, the old one. Well, she's talking about this movie. So there you go. Bam. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, uh, so little little Leon doesn't actually go full wolf. Uh, we see the fangs, and he does look kind of creepy <laughs> hanging around on the bars there. Uh, but love conquers the you monster. never go full wolf. Never go full wolf. Is that a, what we do in Never the shadows? Go full wolf. <laughs> no, that's no, tropic, tropic thunder. thunder. Oh, tropic, right. <laughs> it's a different word. Yeah. Yeah, different word. <laughs> uh, so they uh, then we jump ahead, and this settles into our third uh, section of the movie. Um, we're full grown adult. Uh, Oliver Reed is uh, setting out to leave his parents' uh, uh, fortress, house, mansion, villa to. Uh, villa. Is it a villa? That's like Italian. What what is it if it's Spanish? Maybe Spanish villa too. Okay, uh, and he's going to strike out on his own and find they his own. Just call it a villa. <laughs> the villa. Dumb Spanish joke. Well, this is going to okay. So what we have to do here, right, is like now that he's leaving the familial bonds, right, where that can can contain the beast, he's going to go out into the world and either he's going to indulge one uh, instinct or the other. So we have to set up. Uh, uh, he's got to fall in love with a pretty girl. So who is this, and how does he meet her? Who? Uh, what does he do? Uh, Fernando? Is that is that their names? The family uh, that. Which one? The ro- one because he goes to work at a vineyard. First of all, I love, I love the way that he just kind of stumbles into town, and the guy walks in. He's like, "You look strong. Come with me." <laughs> I have a job. Like, for you'll you. work here and you'll sleep here. And this is what you'll earn. It's just like, we just met 30 seconds ago, but okay. It's amazing how easy it was back in the olden days. I used to, to find a job. <laughs> just like, okay, you can do it. Are you a complete idiot? No, work for me. Yeah. And he meets his uh, buddy down in the cellars. Uh, these guys are going to become fast friends. This is the friend who probably indulges a little too much in the product that they're making. This is Jose. Yeah. Jose's looks, a character. Looks like British Jason Siegel, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he did. He really did. <laughs> but he meets this girl. Uh, it's the winemaker's daughter, but she is of engaged. Of course it is. <laughs> well, I mean, the winemaker's daughter. There's, <laughs> there's sonnets written about this kind of thing. Um, uh. <laughs> and But she's betrothed to another guy, apparently a wealthy uh, family somewhere in the Rico. town. Now... This I didn't catch until this viewing, and I've seen this movie before, right? Because I've always thought that, like, my God, uh, Oliver Reed and this woman fall in love, like, immediately, right? Yes. But this time around, I caught it that it, it's at least been three days because they're, they're, you see her riding back with the uh, the other guy, and apparently they were gambling somewhere out of town nearby, and he just had to lose because she had to come home because she has a headache. She's had a headache for three days. I'm like, oh, because she's coming back every night so she can see Oliver Reed. <laughs> Bam. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah because it does, it does happen quick. I'm like, did okay, they must have been doing this for a while because she goes around the side and then runs into his arms. And she's like, oh, okay, they're at this already. Yeah. yeah. Right? And this is like, so, you know, yeah. you should marry me, Christine. You know, Oliver Reed's a very uh, intense. He's one of those intense actors. Very passionate fellow, yes. Yeah. 
Especially when he's, when he's uh, screaming, get away, get away. Yeah. Yes. I would believe that was his real sweat. <laughs> right. Out the movie. Yeah. And he kind of looks like a werewolf uh, even before. I thought, I thought you were going to say he kind of looks like a guy that would be sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Sweaty werewolf. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's hiding something within himself. Of course, now, you know, knowing what we know about Oliver Reed, they were right all along. So this was like spot on casting. Um, Jose takes um, Oliver, his character's name now, um, Leon, takes Leon to yes. a brothel, right? This is where the movie uh, changes its course and lays in like where we're heading toward the end. Um, at the brothel, he's they're entertaining a couple of ladies of the evening. And I think the uh, because he's in a in, in a situation of vice, uh, the beast. It's on a full moon, and so he uh, accompanies a prostitute up to her room, and then turns into a werewolf and kills her. Michaela is very disappointed by this moment in the film. Yeah, because there's no transformation scene, and it feels like you're gonna get it, and then it. Monster Squad did a better like take on this than this movie. That's interesting. Now yeah, you say there was Monsters no money behind the a transformation. Too. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's a, a, because the only thing you could do, you know, I mean, this is obviously long before the air bladder technology that you could use in, like, uh, that's why American Werewolf won an Oscar, why the howling in 81, you know, they were so revolutionary. Because before that, I mean, hell, I saw werewolf movies in, like, the late 70s that were still employing the lap dissolve technique of, you know, you lock your actor in place and you put some extra hair on him and shoot a little bit more and put some extra hair on him and that kind of stuff. I mean, so they were doing that from right. the forties to That's the something. <laughs> You know, it, like in monster squad, when Dracula turns from like the bat into Dracula, like the way they, it's three shots. It's like the bat, like his hand and then like a full shot of him, like transformed. It's, beautiful and that cost no money like they could have done something just you know cut to you know show his hand cut to a wolf hand and then cut to like a wide body of him in the makeup you know i don't have to see everything change yeah unfortunately they they there's no transformation it's a shock that you know all of a sudden the the furry wolf hand comes in that's all you get to see furry wolf hand strangling people you do actually see uh which you know again for the time I think the 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 prostitute dead on the bed with the blood all over. I mean, like that didn't look like that usual bright red paint that they use in those movies. I mean, that looked more like you know uh, a little darker, yeah, yeah, like movie blood. And I was like, wow, that's pretty gory looking for for that era, especially if we're saying you know now it's like, well, you're doing these things in color for the first time, um, right? He also he kills his uh, the friend uh, Jose. Jose meets his. Uh, 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 untimely end uh we do get to see the werewolf in shadow he's picking people up and throwing them uh but we don't actually see what the beast looks like so the movie is one of these things where is it because of budgetary restriction or because the anticipation of seeing the monster you know it's like are we gonna see it like no we're gonna hint around it we're gonna see the shadow we're gonna see a hand we're not actually gonna see what the actual thing looks like even though like I appreciate that, right? From a filmmaking perspective, if that's what you're going to do, I got it. But from a sure. marketing perspective, uh, the the werewolf is all over the poster, right? So you know, right. going into this movie, what the thing looks like, and so then you're waiting to like, when am I actually going to see it? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and this is only an hour and a half movie, and it's an hour before we get to see the first hint of the werewolf, and like an hour twenty before we get to that, like final run through the city well i actually uh hit the little uh, uh, the timer button to find out like when oliver reed the supposed star of the movie shows up at 48 minutes in right <laughs> and i mean Jeez. but the, the wolfman nice. with benicio del toro didn't give you a werewolf until uh he didn't turn into war that was like an hour into that movie also so i mean there is a history of like they try to you know but again in, in the publicity materials for that they gave out what the thing looked like uh, you know, like a year before the movie came out. Actually, I think the Wolfman, the Benicio del Toro one, does have some, um, you know, um, debt to this movie and its design of the werewolf, with the you know bare chested uh, fur, you know, coming out and the white shirt and all that. It's a kind of a mm. yeah. that movie had a lot of like tension building to that moment too. Um, whereas this one, I was like, 
it, it's like they forgot this was a werewolf movie for a while. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a melodrama hammer movie. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. got a werewolf at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Because it's a. Uh, it's the well, sounds like yeah. I have yeah, but I have a theory. <laughs> and again, I, I get it. You're saying like, well, I came for a werewolf movie, and and where's my werewolf? Uh, but it seems to me, you know, watching it this time, I'm like, who is the central protagonist of the movie? Who's the main character in the movie? Maybe the father. See, I'm I'm going with it's the dad. Not only because yeah. Clifford Evans, Evans gets top billing because he was probably a bigger star. That's what I thought the first time, but it's narrated by him. He's the character who shows up the entire way through it. Uh, it's Very basically true. him, right? I mean, that's the thing that he has taken in this kid who has uh, well, the wild streak or whatever. And so he can foretell what the kid's future is going to be. And it's up to him to love the kid, you know, to try and keep him from uh, wolfing out. You know, and then it's like, is he going to be able to accomplish this? And, you know, usually these movies have some kind of back, back in this era anyway, do the thing where, you know, a werewolf can only be killed by someone who loves him. And you're like, well, is it going to be uh, the girl? Uh, it ends up being the father, right? The father has right. to be the one to go and get the uh, the silver bullet uh, to actually kill the guy at the end after he has a rampage. Uh, nobody believes him. That he's going to turn into a werewolf, but he does. They catch him for the murders, you right? And uh, yeah. he does turn into a werewolf finally in the jail scene. What do we think about this scene? Because there's a little bit of a transformation that happens there. Not much, but a little bit. What do you think of it? Mm, hands. <laughs> hands that look like he, he got wet hands and dipped them in just mowed grass. That's what it looked like to me. <laughs> hands that, yeah, don't move at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And look, don't look proportionally right in size either. It's like mm-hmm. instead of taking, you know, Oliver Reed's hands and having him, uh, you know, like sit in makeup while they applied it over the series of yeah. hours and took the exposures, they just made, they sculpted hands and apply hair to them. And it's a lap design. Feels like it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's weird. Which is unfortunate because I think the werewolf itself, uh, I, I kind of dig this look. Um, yeah, he looks good. Like he's a good looking werewolf. They don't go for the, <laughs> they don't go for the snout. You know, I mean, he's a good-looking man, but he's a good-looking. I mean, he's too. a good-looking werewolf. It's not usually my type, but he's a good-looking werewolf. <laughs> right? Usually, they're a little too wolfy for me, but I like it. Well, he still has like a semblance of a face, right? It's like underneath this. Like I think they they widened his nostrils, maybe, but they didn't give him the the dog nose, which a lot of werewolf no. movies do, right? They did not. And then they gave him, the, obviously, the eyebrow and the hair piece, and he's got two ears that are sticking up, which I think is the first time that you see that in a movie, you know, kind of the dog ears. Um, he's silver-maned, which yes. is also like, a, okay, if you're going to do this in color for the first time, I, I just always assume that Lon Chaney Jr. had, like, you know, brown hair. You know? Yeah, it's usually darker. This is uh, this is different in that it's like he's, a, he's silver-haired. Yeah. He's a silver fox. Which is, uh, so the Monster Squad's werewolf that Michaela was talking stop about. i complimenting this man's look. <laughs> I was like, you're just, you're just digging it deeper, man. <laughs> oh. Well, the, uh, the, so, the, well, I guess the, the, the werewolf in this movie was designed by a guy, a guy named uh, Roy Ashton. Uh, Roy Ashton also did a bunch of other Hammer movies, including, uh, he did The Mummy, made up uh, Christopher Lee as The Mummy. Uh, he did the reptile and the Gorgon. Uh, he went over and worked for the other, uh, British, uh, horror studio, which was Amicus films. You can always know an Amicus movie also stars Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, but, uh, they're usually anthology movies like tales from the crypt was, uh, an Amicus movie and from beyond the grave, which we did on the show. We did both of those on the show. Um, but eventually he, the grave where, where, uh, Peter Cushing's the old man, yeah, who runs the store? Uh, owns, runs, runs the, the antique store? Or the antique store? Yeah, yeah, okay, antique I remember. Store, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was an amicus. Uh, amicus. So, I mean, okay. amicus was different than Hammer. The amicus was run by two American guys, uh, but it was a British studio, and they kept on poaching Hammer talent. You know, their stars. But I think I don't think Donald Pleasance ever did a Hammer movie, but he did several of the uh, the amicus films, and I think he was like the next edition to the horror lineup of uh, like mm-hmm. Cushing and Lee. And then you had like Donald Pleasance, you know, and in America, AIP American international pictures had uh, Vincent price. 
you know, that was what was going on in the 60s. Sorry, this is where, we, where we're at in time when these are, are happening. But uh, well, Pleasance is a good addition to all that. Yeah, right? And I don't yeah. think he was ever in, like, the team-ups. Whenever they would do the things like, uh, what was it, the, the not the Midnight Hour, the House of the Long Shadows, where it got Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing and John Carradine, and who was the other guy? I can't remember now. But they brought them all together, and uh, Basil Rathbone, maybe. I think it was somebody uh, who was like, <laughs> and they put them all in a little dark good. house. Yeah, I, apparently it's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As well, Desi Arnaz Jr. Donald Pleasant. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, anyway, Ashton, Roy Ashton, uh, eventually he went to work on, uh, he was on star Wars. Um, and I believe that, um, Rick or not, um, uh, not Rick Baker. Um, oh God, I'm totally drawing a blank. The exorcist Dick Smith. Dick Smith thank you very much. Uh, had actually called him, uh, for, uh, some advice on making up Dustin Hoffman to look like an old man and a little big man. So, you know, call back to Roy Ashton. So, I mean, his, I, I think his werewolf in this is pretty fucking cool. Look. <laughs> or wolf man, wolf man, not a werewolf. Although it's a curse of the werewolf. Sure. Right. It looks cool, but like you don't even get enough time to really take it all in. Right. They always cut away, like when you see it. I don't know if they're trying to do like a shock thing or something. Like at one point, he like you see him in kind of out of focus. He moves into focus, and then he snarls and moves out of focus again, and like attacks the camera. Um, yeah. You do see a little. There is one shot of Oliver Reed like mid transformation. I think after the hands, right where he's in this jail cell and he transforms. Um, you get to yeah. see he's got contacts in, or like you know his forehead's all bulged out, or something like that. Um, but then the, the werewolf does go on a rampage. Is it a rampage? Through the town? I mean, He's just kind of yeah. running around. Yeah, he does a few things. He knocks some stuff over. It's basically like <laughs> it's like an Avengers Endgame where Hulk is, uh, where Smart Hulk is pretending to be the other Hulk and he's just kind of going through and rampaging. He's like, uh. <laughs> you really got Avengers uh, on brain today, don't you? <laughs> yeah, apparently. Specifically it's kind of like that. But he, he and he does uh, he does they almost burn some motherfuckers. I'll give him that. What are you talking about? Well, I mean, they uh, one of the there's a, a crowd with you know torches and pitchforks following him through the town, and he climbs up into a, a hayloft and they throw a, a torch up there, lights the hay a hay bundle on fire, and then he flips that shit down to the crowd, and it bounces into like five people. <laughs> and I'm surprised no one was burned severely. For all we know, they were. I don't know, but uh, it was a very close. Uh, uh, close stunt, and I put quotations around that. Don't you miss <laughs> the era of like danger and stunts? <laughs> I love this stuff. I right. mean, I don't, I don't wish harm on anybody, <laughs> right? No, but that's fun. Like <laughs> we've talked about how we've seen stunts in movies where, like, well, that guy died. Yeah, mm -hmm. the road warrior. And it does make it exciting. <laughs> yeah, it does. Or Metal Storm when that. Yeah. Um, yes. One of the, the guy, greatest. Yeah, uh, that guy's dead. What's the greatest fire stunt that you've ever seen, Sean? There's oh, a the scene in another world. Yeah. Well, you can add that to the list of fucking dangerous looking fire scenes because they're just throwing gasoline everywhere. It's nuts. If you haven't seen it, find that scene where they light everything on fire. Um, people were definitely injured in that. Yeah. Cause there's like a guy with a mattress, like he's holding the mattress up yeah. right behind a door and they, yeah. they throw this flaming, like you know, just, they throw fire at him. And you're like, Oh my God. And this set has like low ceilings and all that. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> Curse of the world. Wood and yeah, it doesn't get that, <laughs> that nuts, but it was like, Whoa, somebody felt a little bit of heat. on. <laughs> yes. The werewolf this ends up scene with the werewolf running around. Just, it made me feel like, um, like I was watching like Quasimodo run through Paris to get to Notre Dame. I was, I was like, same thing. Yeah. yeah. Like I've seen this before guys. Yeah. Yeah. It really does have echoes of that. Cause he, uh, for some reason I was actually thinking about that. Like, like everybody always runs up, they climb up the werewolf, you know, uh, a creature that you don't usually expect to be like, you know, uh, scaling the sides of buildings and stuff like that ends up, you know, always going for higher ground, which ends up where it, it, it pins him. You know, you can't, there's nowhere left to go. You got villagers at the bottom. You come down, they get you, you know, where are you going to go? But I think it's just an instinct. You want to get away from something. So you want to get up high and above it. Then right. ultimately, uh, then you're stuck. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, now everything when they're doing these monster movies is CG, so it's them running across multiple rooftops to get away. And, like, that's why they go Mm -hmm. up now, because they can do that. It happened in The Wolfman, right? Benicio Del Toro's. Yeah. He's up on roofs running around. Yeah. It happened in The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. (laughs) Yeah, it happens in in Van Helsing. And then then they just swing. Van Helsing is a movie. They swing from... Uh, they're like apparently the 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 ropes are tied on clouds or something. I don't know. They lassoed the moon or something. I don't know what the hell they're always swinging from something. You're like, wait, what's up there? Isn't it the sky? Yeah. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah, birds. Uh, they're just lassoing birds. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, uh, Hammer did not make this. Was Hammer's one and only uh, werewolf movie? Um, surprising because, like I said, even the Mummy. Uh, they didn't actually make a sequel to The Mummy, but they made three other Mummy movies that are unrelated. Um, and they made, I think, you know, if you go back through their filmography, you're mostly going to find vampire movies. Because in addition to the Dracula movies, they also had um, the Karnstein movies, which started with uh, Vampire Lovers. And that was kind of a like its own three um, episode. You know, they're related by the family. And then Captain Kronos kind of, becomes like a fourth uh, unofficial entry in that by one line of dialogue that ties that back in. <laughs> so lots of vampires, uh, lots of Frankensteins, um, only one werewolf, unfortunately. Um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, the company eventually kept on making uh, vampire movies until it was not in vogue anymore. Uh, they were doing them still in the 70s. Obviously, we saw Dracula 1972, which, you know, at that point in time, you're two years away from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, the you know the Exorcist is out the following year. Uh, you know Rosemary's Baby, The Omen, and uh, they just couldn't compete. And uh, they eventually started just throwing anything that w- might work, which ended up uh, taking them to the Far East, where we did uh, uh, the Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires on this show. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I have to check and see if Michael Ripper was in that one. Maybe he's on his way <laughs> to the Maybe. wall of fame. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, they folded, uh, I believe, to the devil. A daughter with Christopher Lee uh, was their final movie. That or the lady vanishes. Let's say it was to the devil. A daughter with Natasha Kinski. You guys were asking it was last week. We were, t- were we talking about Klaus Kinski. You know him as the dad of Natasha. Yeah. Okay. There you oh go. yeah, we did talk about Klaus Kinsey. Yeah, the weird looking dude. Yeah. Yes. Um and then Hammer came back. Hammer is back now. Kind of, sort of. They just what came did, out with the What did the they lodge. just do? The Lodge? I think it was theirs. Right. Yeah. Right. Because they came back with like Let Me In, which unfortunately is a good movie that nobody saw. Um then they did a couple of like uh, the the quiet ones, which wasn't oh, the, but the woman in black was like a huge hit and kind of Re uh, gave them some money, which they blew on. Yeah, (laughs) then they. Well, so does the lot. So they're not doing very well. Yeah, Uh, Winchester was supposed to be one of theirs, but somehow they lost it. I remember. Yeah, that wasn't good. And uh, but these movies that they are making, at least they do kind of feel like Hammer movies. You know, like okay, I could see that company still doing this, but the Quiet Ones wasn't good. Woman in Black Two was bad. Um, so I think the best movie is probably let me in and everybody just defaults back to let the right one in or the original. And so, uh, let me in is worth a watch though. It's actually really yeah, let good. Me in's good. I like mm-hmm. let me in. Yeah. 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 I liked it a lot too. Do I like it better than the first one? I don't know. They both have good <laughs> points too. They do. I don't know. All right. Well, listener, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go around the room. We're going to tell you if you should check out Curse of the Werewolf. Uh, But before we do that, we're going to have to answer some of your mail. We love to hear from you. And to do that, we're going to need the assistance of our mailman. His name, ironically, Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Oh, I thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. He's looking He's a little, little furry today. Yeah, right. He He's needs the. That. It's quarantine. He hasn't been able to get a haircut. <laughs> He's got that very pronounced brow. He is also always yeah. sweating. He could be a werewolf. Sweating, dripping, something. Sweating, oozing. Yeah. Well, we want to tell you folks how you can join the Freak Show family. All you got to do is follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. On Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. By email. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. 
or on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. Tanya Taylor writes in about Curse of the Werewolf. She says, I love this movie. I'm a big Hammer fan, and I love Oliver Reed. It's not my favorite werewolf movie, but it's worth a watch. All right, yeah. Connor Nee writes in and says, it's not a bad show for those days. They have the aristocracy bang on. (laughs) Sure. Uh, Nelson (laughs) Nascimento writes in and says, Oliver Reed could quite possibly be a werewolf in this one. A bit of a slow start, but the great second half and some interesting twists on the mythos. I wish Hammer would have made more werewolf films. I wish they would have tried a little harder. Yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit more. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, B-Movie Poster Vault writes in. He says he watched this a year or so back as part of his Saturday Night Cinema crew, picked up the Hammer Horror Blu-ray set. That's right. It just came out from Shout Factory. They're re-releasing all these movies that Universal Pictures actually already put out on on Blu-ray in a set. Um, Mm -hmm. But he says, I remember enjoying it quite a bit. And uh, while thinking that the casting legendary booze hound Oliver Reed meant it'd be the only werewolf you could defeat with a silver hip flask. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, About last week's episode, we watched a movie called Serenity. Okay, so this is the Curse of the Werewolf episode, so we're not going to spoil Serenity. Uh, You have to go back and and watch that uh, or listen to our episode. Grant Parrish writes in and says, I watched this before the Saturday Night Freak Show episode aired. I have got to start waiting for the recommendation. Considering the contest and the (laughs) twist, it's really weird that Matthew McConaughey has so many sex scenes in this movie. I'm not sure their screenwriters thought through the Oedipal ramifications of that. So I'm saying, man, that's the most twisted Mm -hmm. part of that movie. Agreed. Very twisted. (laughs) Uh, Leamy72 says, was it me or was the first half of it hard to understand what they were saying like another language or mumbling? Yeah, yeah. There was, yeah, it wasn't good. What are we saying? Sound quality or just dialogue? What are we talking about? I don't about? know. It, Anne Hathaway's delivery was weird. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, the week before that, we watched a movie called Bad Taste um, from Peter Jackson. Ryan Handsome Jansen writes in and says, brain dead known to us here stateside as dead alive uses slapstick violence perfectly uh he made a really excellent trilogy with his first three films that would be of course uh bad taste uh, meet the feebles and dead alive we were talking on that show about uh mm-hmm. the using extreme gore as slapstick splat stick comedy yes, yes. Mm-hmm. so we need to do meet the feebles now to complete the trilogy boom there you go i don't know if i've ever seen that <laughs> the whole way through yeah, I have not seen it at all. Someday we'll get to it. <laughs> all right. Uh, the week before that, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we watched The Relic. Uh, Richard Pulfer writes in and says, I'm a big fan of the Aloysius Pendergrass novels by Douglas Preston, but I have mixed feelings about his absence from the flick. He's basically Sherlock mm-hmm. Holmes, and I'm not sure he could have saved the movie beyond dropping some exposition here and there. Mm. probably right you got to go back and listen to our relic episode yeah apparently they (laughs) left out a major character from the novel who has spun off a series of uh of books all right uh so now we're gonna go around the room tell you what we thought of curse of the werewolf starting with sean what did you think of curse of the werewolf uh curse of the werewolf all right so pros of this movie um i like the monster uh, I think the look is cool. Uh, I wish we'd gotten more of it. Um, I like I like Oliver Reed as an actor. I mean, he's kind of just uh, he's he's very he's very expressive. He's very sweaty, um, but it works for him in this movie. Um, any other pluses to this? Um, uh, it's it's pretty much your basic like your hammer actors throughout the movie and not say that's bad but it's exactly what you know you get in these movies um cons of this movie um it is a melodrama and i was not expecting that um there is not enough werewolf in this movie for me um there's nothing necessarily wrong with the movie it's just not it's not what i was expecting but what i got is it's not enough for me to go back to like i could just watch this last 10 minutes of of uh, the werewolf running amok on YouTube and be fine. I really don't need the rest of this movie. 
Um, I think it's been done better. I would like, I wish hammer had done more of these because uh, I think they really could have done something cool with them based on how, what they did with, you know, uh, Dracula and Frankenstein. Um, but they didn't do enough in this one for me. So I'm going to pass on, uh, the curse of the werewolf. Holly, what'd you think? Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I like the design of the monster. Um, I think it's, it's pretty solid, especially for the time. Um, but I, I'm going to disagree that there's that you say there's nothing wrong with the movie. I think there's plenty wrong with the movie. Starting with it was very boring. It, it was uh, the the story is just. I mean, it's fairly predictable. You know what you're getting going into a werewolf movie. I'll give you that. But they're trying to like take the emotional angle on it and given that I really made no emotional attachment to the, any character in this movie, it doesn't work. You know, like I, like you're right. It's a melodrama, but we don't really connect with the characters. It's like watching a soap opera. You don't really give a shit about them, but you're just invested. You're not invested in this. Um, it just, it just didn't work. You, you wait a really long time to see the werewolf, um, and, you know, I know we've debated before, like, is it better to see the monster right away or is it better to have like a to have a, an extended period where you don't see it? You know, is it better to show it less? But in this case, like we just it took too long and we didn't get enough of it. I think we needed more of the, the monster to make it worthwhile at all. Um, yeah, they're just I, I wasn't really invested in this movie. It was, it was this, the good stuff came too late and. It wasn't enough to, to keep me interested. Um, so I'm going to say that you could probably pass on Curse of the Werewolf. Yeah. Michaela. Yeah, I think that, you know, you're expecting certain boxes to be checked when you go into a, mo- a movie with werewolf in the title. Uh, Curse of the Werewolf is a really cool title, but like that yeah. hypes up something much more than what this delivered for me. Um, it doesn't really check it many of the like werewolf movie boxes. I don't think at all. You don't get a transformation. You really don't even get any cool kills or anything. It's it's a really tame, really mild werewolf movie. And I mean, I guess if you're a completionist, maybe watch it, but it's like, I can see why they didn't make any more. I can't imagine this one was hugely successful for them. But, um, it, yeah, it just doesn't deliver on anything I would, I want to see in a werewolf movie. The look is cool, but it's the end of the movie. And that's, it, it's been such a drama for so long about like aristocracy and like peasants versus the rich, you know, that I'm just like, cool, but not in this movie. Like, you <laughs> yeah. know, um, so I'm going to pass on curse of the werewolf too. Colin. Uh, Michaela, you were uh, you were talking about a werewolf, and a cattail went up behind you, and it kind of freaked me out a little bit. I'm just like, Wait, what's going on? Like the one time my cat decides to come sit with me is like when I'm trying to talk for a significant amount of time, of course. Yes, a little freaked out. Okay, misses your mama. Um, yeah, I don't know. I uh, uh, as far as like uh, just you know, I'm a, I'm a big werewolf movie fan. I guess uh, is the werewolf my favorite of the classic monsters? Maybe I think the Wolfman obviously is of the Dracula, Frankenstein, uh, mummy um, group. Uh, so I think you know when I look back, like I was never really a big fan of. Um, uh, werewolf of london which i guess technically is the first universal um werewolf movie i really like the wolfman in 41 and you know it's cool to see lon cheney jr do that but he did it like five times he was the only uh hammer um or sorry universal player to be the same mo- always he always was the wolfman nobody else played him for universal um so then when hammer comes along it's like this is um I like the way that it tweaks the mythology. I guess that's the structure of this movie to me was a plus, you know, the idea that it kind of is like this, uh, well, not so much, but I guess multi-generational story, you know, which follows the inception of this curse. And then you watch the curse, how it plays out. And then there's a kid and the kid's born with this. And so what's going to happen to the kid? And eventually the kid's going to turn into a werewolf and go berserk. And how are we going to, you know, um, 
So I don't know. That to me was like really compelling. And, uh, you know, so I like that storyline. Uh, I like the uniqueness of setting a, a werewolf movie in Spain because, you know, it's like, okay, Spanish werewolves. Although, uh, <laughs> okay, so. They have little, they have little mustaches. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they speak in an accent. They well, growl in an I, accent. Yeah, but I shouldn't make fun of it because uh, speaking of Spain, right, I think the guy who takes the record probably for playing the same werewolf character the most is a guy named Paul Nashi, who is an actor from Spain. Mm. His real name is Jacinto Molina. And he was a werewolf called Waldemar Daninsky, a doomed Polish, uh, was he a count? I'm not sure if he was a count, but uh, thir- I think 13 movies. Uh, he played beginning Damn. with Frankenstein's Bloody Terror in the late 60s, all the way through uh, some Japanese thing that he did in like the mid 80s. Uh, so, and he's, you know, Wolfman, like he wanted to be Lon Chaney Jr. I think. So in 1980, like what? One or three, 81, 83. I can't remember when night of the werewolf was made. He's still doing the lap dissolve when, you know, everybody else is doing the, you know, now we've got, you know, rubber prosthetics that can stretch faces and do all this other stuff. Uh, so in the, in the history of werewolf movies, uh, I really like Curse of the Werewolf because it's it's different than the other ones. Um, you know, and the mythology is different. It's got its own you know uh, groove going on there. Uh, I like the performances. I mean, Oliver Reed. It's like okay, you can see why this guy's going to be a star uh, just based on his you know charisma or his screen presence. I guess maybe you'd say uh, the werewolf makeup is uh, really cool. We forgot to mention that at the end, unlike other werewolf movies, uh, after he shot... Oh, and that's the other thing, too. Uh, he has a squib. He oh, explodes he blood. Back. And he doesn't turn back. Yeah, but I don't think there were squibs, uh, like bloodshot squibs in 1961. Right? That's no. like really early and kind of graphic. Uh, but yeah, he doesn't turn back. He dies as the beast. Um, which uh, I think caused problems with the British censors. Michael was saying it probably didn't do well for Hammer. It didn't, but that was because uh, on the British cut deleted so much of the movie. I, it was like, I don't know, several minutes. Uh, like even at the end, you couldn't have the, the even the medium close up of Oliver Reed lying there with the blood on him. They cut that out. The, the close-up yeah. on his face, they cut that out. So you're kind of left with an almost incomprehensible movie, I guess, is what uh, British audiences saw in 1961. It became, um, I think, a cult thing, you know, be- through its airings on TV and stuff like that. Um, and now I think it is kind of recognized as, like, you know, uh, one of the, the classic werewolf uh, movies. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I think uh, that you should check it out. Um I guess that's the final word on Curse of the Werewolf. Next week, we're watching a movie that's chosen by. John, what are we watching next week? And is it free? <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> look, uh, we're in some crazy times right now. That's so true. I'm going to pull a crazy move. Oh, and boy. we are going to be doing a freak show rewind. And we <laughs> are going to be watching Spookies. <laughs> I've never actually seen this. I know. I know. Colin is speechless. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, Colin. Yeah, we got to have an off mic right conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, possibly spookies again possibly next week. Spookies. Or you can just go back and listen to the old episode. All right. So, that's next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show. And until then, the basement is going dark. <laughs>